Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is Demetrius Lajotis. I am the President and Chief Operating Officer of Realnex, and I want to welcome you to another in our series of industry-focused uh, webinars. Today, we have the great pleasure of welcoming Richard Wilson, the founder and CEO of Family Office Club, which is the number one global association of family offices. Uh, Richard is um, a prolific content generator uh, and beyond his uh, three number one best-selling books on family offices. He does a lot in terms of podcasts, videos, and has a, a great newsletter that I would encourage you to sign up for, which is a lot of good information in there. Uh, Richard and his company uh, help their members source uh, uh, opportunities as well as sometimes, I believe, invest alongside them. And he also coaches sponsors on how to work with family offices. Um, the, the club has over 3,000 registered investors. And today, Richard's going to be talking to us about uh, co-GP investment structures, as well as how to work with family offices. And uh, I think you're going to find this uh, a very informative uh, session if you do, but also encourage you to think about attending the Family Office Super Summit, which takes place next Monday. Uh, you have the opportunity to join both in person or virtually, and they have over 800 people uh, signed up so far to attend. They have 57 speakers, uh, which will run the gamut. The Family Office uh, Club and their members invest in a variety of different asset classes, but real estate is a, a significant one and of growing importance, and where Richard is, is focusing. So I think we're gonna have a, a lot of good content. And if you do attend the summit next week, uh, please feel free to come up and say hello to me. I will be there. And uh, with that, Richard, I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Demetrius. Appreciate you having me here. And um, I think everyone can see my PowerPoint slides here already. Uh, right, Demetrius? Yes. Great. Uh, so we're gonna talk about raising capital with family offices, working with family offices. Um, if you are a family office or private investor, that part is just going to be 10 to 12 minutes here. And then we're going to go into investment structures and why the structure of an investment matters more than the strategy a lot of the time and talk about co-GP deals a little bit. Um, we're going to cover all of that in 30 minutes. So we don't take up too much of your day here today. So um, first of all, We've been in business since 2007, uh, met in person with 3,000 family offices, have written 13 books, and we've hosted 150 live events. We usually do about 15 to 20 live events per year, so the insights from this PowerPoint um, and this webinar here today are really coming from all of our work and daily text messages, emails, phone calls with our investor clients and being at all those live events that we've hosted. This is my wife and three daughters. Um, and my wife and I are always trying to go on some fun adventure trip, so happy to trade notes on stuff like that with you guys if you're uh, at one of our live events at some point. Uh, just to get to know us a little bit better, uh, we're good at building investor funnels in a niche position. Uh, some of our platforms besides Family Office Club um, are billionaires.com, commercialrealestate.com. We work with passive investors at investorclub.com. Uh, we're also good at structuring deals, which we'll talk about here today and also putting billionaires or heads of publicly traded companies on other people's boards or advisory boards is something we've developed uh, some experience in as well. So uh, to begin with, let's talk about how to work with more ultra wealthy families. Some of them call themselves family offices. Some of them have a fully formalized family office. Some of them don't. But the main point is if somebody has 30, 50, 100 million, million plus in net worth, uh, they're going to be a more powerful partner. We're going to get some examples of this later. Um, and some case studies of how it can transform a business. But the point of this slide is just to show you that if you want to be really good at getting quality deals or attracting a lot of quality investors, you need to think about not just one strategy, but a platform approach of being in the right communities, having the right positioning, proactively reaching out to high quality investors, acquiring choke points that are strategic leverage points in your industry and then operating within the business that you're in if you want to have an information advantage of what's going on uh, in the space. We also recommend that you build an investor funnel. Uh, I had to figure this out the hard way just by reading a bunch of marketing and sales books and applying it to the world of raising capital. And so part of what we do at Family Office Club besides host investor summits is we do capital raising workshops. We teach people how to raise capital more effectively. 
Um, we do about a dozen of those workshops per year and about seven or eight investor summits per year. Um, the event that Demetrius was talking about that's on Monday is our annual uh, largest event called the Family Office Super Summit. And um, if anyone wants to learn more about that, it's at familyoffices.com forward slash super. Uh, but at our workshops, we really drive home in a couple of them how important it is to have this investor funnel because almost none of your competitors do. Your competitors may have an Excel spreadsheet or a CRM of potential investors. They may pay for investor relations software, which helps organize investors once they've invested and get them their distributions and K-1s, et cetera. But most of them, even that have those two things in place, don't have a funnel, which means they don't have things which attract investors to them. It's one thing to have a pitch deck so that when you meet an investor, you can explain what you do. Most people are missing from that a one pager uh, to really get them interested in reading a pitch deck. Most people are missing a short video from the founder that's two or three minutes long to get someone's attention. Um, and that can be embedded in a pitch deck or a PowerPoint. Um, but that's really after the investor knows you exist. You can't show a pitch deck really to someone if they don't know that you exist in the industry. So how do you get their attention in the first place? That's through the funnel. Um, and so we've learned a lot about doing this because for 14 years, we've built multiple investor funnels ourselves. That's what we're doing with billionaires.com. It's what we've been doing for 14 years on Family Office Club. Um, and it's also what we do uh, with, we've served 135 clients to date through pitchdex.com. Uh, and we work with commercial real estate brokers as well as funds and developers and other investment uh, advisors and help them build out all of their marketing assets. And so over 135 clients, we've learned how to do this more fluidly. And if you look at the funnel image on the far left, this is the most simple way to show it, is that at the top of the funnel are the things that are gonna get the most views. They don't take a long time to create, they don't take a long time to consume. And then the funnel goes down deeper and deeper to qualify people more and more, but it also, you are more qualified to them the more of a funnel you've developed. If you're giving live talks at conferences, or you've written a book, or you have white papers, or a benchmark survey, you're more credible of an authority on your niche topic uh, than the next person next to you, and they're more likely to know you exist, and more likely to come through that funnel in order to meet with you, and then invest with you over time. What I found, um, which took me a long time to figure out actually for some reason, was just that most deals get done because there's either deep trust in the team or the leader, there is a deal that's local to somebody, uh, so the opportunity is, is local, or the industry is familiar with the investor. So to give some examples of this, if you're going out to raise capital for a self-storage facility, but that self-storage facility is in New Zealand, and you go to someone who's based in the United States, maybe in San Diego, you say, hey, do you like self-storage? You say yes, but they're not local to the opportunity. They better really trust the team. They probably understand how self-storage works, but they have to really trust the team, and even then, they might not invest in that storage facility in New Zealand. Versus if you go to someone um, who goes to a confusing industry, like a data center piece of real estate, uh, which a lot of people don't understand how those work or metrics or valuation, but the deal is in New York City or in the, around New York City, um, and the investor is from there, then, and if the investor has made their money in the data industry or high tech, and they're aware of the trend of data centers and the future needs for those, then they're much more likely to invest. And so if you're going to investors that don't know you, don't know the industry and are not local to the deal, you're just wasting your time and their time. If you go to investors that are already up all three of these trust curves on some level, then you're gonna do the best. And so everyone goes through their friends and family first and that, that, that gets played out within this diagram as well. And that's why some people invest in their brother-in-law's blockchain deal or something, even if they don't understand it, they'll just put some money in to support their brother-in-law or something or a family member. Um, but once you run out of friends and family, you really should go to people in the industry who are familiar with the industry or who are local to the opportunity before you go to others and use the investor funnel idea to really make them aware of you and your credibility and expertise. This is a diagram we use for making decisions. So we took the Jim Collins hedgehog strategy and added in a few different components to it to make it more relevant for, for us in our business. Um, so we look at Jim Collins' idea that you should only do things you're passionate about, could make a lot of money, and fits your DNA and background. And we layer on top of that, looking at your biggest strength, uh, where there's the most demand or future demand that's inevitable, meaning like growing demand in a niche area uh, or geography, and where's the lowest amount of competition, where are you not 
going in as a commodity offering and looking like every other multifamily product that's on the market uh, that's not really dialed in for a exact set of customer you're trying to approach. And we found that if you screen things by all six of these criteria, that you make much higher deci quality decisions on what should go in your portfolio, where to focus your business. You might, like Sun Tzu says that opportunities multiply as they're seized. And all of us have more opportunities than we have time in the day to chase. So saying no to everything that does not fit all six of these criteria can be super helpful in making sure you're doing what's the most powerful investment of your time and money each day. Many times um, I'm on podcasts and I get asked from the investor side, what's the most important thing when setting up a family office or most important thing you want to say to private investors or when someone has me on a capital raising podcast, they'll say, well, what's the most valuable piece of advice you could give us before we sign off the podcast here today? And it always is the same answer for me. And that's having as high integrity in every part of your business and life as possible. So it's not just moral integrity of um, doing what you know is the good and right thing to do. It's about the food you eat, where you live, who's on your team, what media you consume, um, what assets you purchase, what investors you let in. All of that needs to be aligned or there'll be a lot of friction. And the more aligned you are, then the more that other investors aligned with where you're going will clearly see that you're headed in that direction and that you have your act together and that it looks like a professional uh, organization that's really focused on an area that's playing off of your strengths and that they can relate to as a fellow business owner or investor. So the higher integration of everything that you have, then the faster business goes. And the more that there's friction, then the more painful and slow progress is. Another strategy to raise capital from ultra wealthy investors is to use video. I've had a $500 million net worth families uh, engage with me under contract without meeting in person after they've either read one of my books, listened to a podcast or watched the video. And I've had hundreds of people say that they have watched dozens or a hundred of our videos and that's what brought them into our community or wanted them to come work with us. A recent example of that is a $1.2 billion REIT ran by a network, uh, 100 million plus net worth family that just emailed me cold out of the blue and said, hey, Richard, I've been following you for a few years. I've ducked into a couple of your events and I'm really careful on who I associate with, but now I wanna do a, a lot of business with you and I wanna use your family office club organization to source excellent real estate uh, sponsors. And so that came to us through just having the media out there and the high quality events, et cetera. Um, that's just an example of what videos can do. Most people don't create any videos um, and having at least a short video from your founder uh, within your materials, website, et cetera, is super critical uh, and not worrying about overproducing them um, is also something important to remember. Okay, now I wanna go to the, the second half of what I wanted to cover today, which is the importance of investment structures. Um, hey, Richard. So, um before we uh, switch gears here, um, first I want to let everyone know if they do have questions, they can put them into the uh, the question section there. But also um, to round out the the topic that you were just on, um, you recently uh, put put a newsletter out or a blog piece about the time it takes to develop relationships, and I, I thought that that's it was a very interesting piece uh, and, and maybe I think add some value to the conversation here that would be helpful for the folks. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up um, because the most valuable investor I have, I've known for a decade. We got a couple of small deals done together over the past three, four years. He's spoken at a couple of my events um, to date but now we're working together in a big way. And what we're doing is um, putting together a co-GP joint venture program and putting together uh, $300 million uh, equity term sheets with counterparties. But he only trusts me with that because I've known him for a decade and he's been to the events and seen our team, et cetera. And another member of our group, they spent three years calling on meeting with people in our community without making a lot of progress. And then they raised an $8 million and a $40 million equity check. And a $40 million equity check equals 400 investors at $100,000 a piece. So it's worth the time is the main message. The best relationship we have is with a billionaire that we've known for a decade. And now we're putting together $300 million in equity term sheets to flow money from their publicly traded 
entity into multifamily sponsors, self-storage groups, et cetera. And the only reason he trusts me with that is because we've known each other for a decade, et cetera. Um, so with a lot of family offices, they'll want to get to know you slowly over one or two or three plus years. And then the big business might get done one, two, three, five, seven years down the road. So if all you care about is the next 12 months and you're about to retire, or you just care about the next deal you're getting done, you're not going to do well in the family office space because you need to build credibility with them, build a relationship and, and add value first. So it's definitely uh, an important point. Were there any questions that came up in the um, chat box, Demetrius? Is there anything else you want uh, me to touch on? No, not yet. It's, it, it sounds like part of it is that they not want they not only want to vet people, but they're looking at it as an investment in the person to help them with their business. And they're not looking necessarily to make a one-off investment. They want to be able to, they want to find people that they can find reliable, good deal flow from that they believe they can trust for the long term, it seems to be. Right, right. Like they care a lot about the, the structure of the deal. They care about the strategy, but they would rather invest with somebody that they really trust um, and know is going to do the right thing at every turn, even if they have, let's say, um, only a 15% IRR compared to a group that seems a little bit, you know, high stress or not aligned with them or just something about them that seems a little bit off or they don't take themselves as seriously or as professional as the other group, even if they're promising a 19% IRR. Uh, they'd rather work with a group that they really trust and think are solid and are aligned with them. So that's really important. And I think a lot of people get that wrong and they think, oh, I've got the best deal in the world. Who do you have that can connect me to? But, you know, it's like uh, everyone's got a deal, right? And, and the, the funniest line I hear you can probably relate to is someone is like, oh my gosh, we have so much deal flow. We, we have more deal flow than we have capital to put to work. And it's like, well, so does right. anybody who has access to LoopNet, right? I mean, that, that means absolutely <laughs> nothing, like, right? It's like, uh, it makes you think that they just started their business off Craigslist that morning or something. So, right. um, yeah, just some mistakes to avoid, I guess. Um, but feel free, if anyone has questions, just submit them as we go. I'm happy to be transparent in what we're seeing and what we're doing, et cetera. Um, the, the second half of the presentation here is really on structures. And I think when people start out in business, they oftentimes think like, oh, I'm not going to say my strategy out loud at this conference. Maybe someone's going to steal my strategy. But all of us know that execution is really where it's at with any strategy. Um, but I think another layer deeper than that or within execution is really the structure of a deal. Because you can give me any deal that you think is good. And if you allow me to structure the deal between the two of us, I'll make it so you could make it. So it's a really bad deal for you and a really good deal for me. Versus if you give me a strategy that is really overcrowded and kind of a lame space to be investing in with a, a bad cap rate going in and no plan to improve the value, I can still make it an amazing deal if I'm allowed to do whatever I want with the structure. So that's something just to keep in mind. The, the structure matters more than the strategy uh, many times. Um, so I'm gonna give some example of that. You can make a deal so that everyone is super aligned or you make a deal so it's really slanted to one party. You can make a deal so it's very transparent um, or you could make a deal where there's almost no communication. You can have optionality built into deals. You could have liability in a deal or not. You could protect yourself from dilution in a deal or not. Performance fees, different types of fees can be worked in there. Collateral could back a deal or not. You can make it an income deal or not. Those are some quick examples. So if you want to get more deals done with ultra wealthy, sophisticated investors, um, you have to look for how do you maximize alignment how do you have handsome rewards for yourself when the deal goes great, but you're not charging them a whole bunch of fees just for tying up their money? Before you've gotten them results, all you've done is caught, had an opportunity cost, and now they did your deal instead of someone else's. Why should they pay you fees just for taking their money before you've produced something? In some deals, you may need to charge fees at cost or some basis points to cover costs. That might just be the reality of where your business is. But you wear confidence on your sleeve when you structure a deal to pay yourself handsomely once it's gone well versus paying yourself handsomely going into the deal and at every turn before it's even gone well for the investor. Um, every deal you do can be made more tax efficient or not, or funds can come from a tax efficient source or not. So I just encourage everyone not to follow the herd. When you go to an attorney, 
and you say, how should I structure this deal? You have to think about their incentives. They want you to do the same structure as the other 20 investment funds they've set up, because then they can charge you $40,000, use their templates, customize paragraphs, you know, 5, 9, 12, and 15, and maybe one other unique thing that they have, and now they get to charge the 30 or $50,000. Now I'm oversimplifying it. My brother's an attorney, so, you know, I'm, I'm being hard on them to make a point. But like, what's their incentive really? To have you do what everyone else is doing so it makes their life a whole lot more simple. Um, and then they say, oh yeah, this is best practice. This is how everyone does it. And then the sponsor says, oh, okay, yeah, I guess we'll do it that way. But like, do you wanna be like everybody else? Do you wanna be average? Do you wanna be a commodity? Do you wanna look the same as everyone else? No, you want an advantage over everyone else. You want an edge and your structure can sweat for you um, or it cannot, it can just sit there and just look like everyone else's. So, um, that's something to really make sure that you take to heart in custom structured deals in a way that serves you and serves your investor much better than the average deal. And if your attorney is lazy, then let me know because I've got a good brother who's who's awesome at that. And not the point of the webinar, but the whole point is don't, don't put up with a lazy attorney who's not creating an awesome structure for you and adding a lot of value there. And always be improving your structure. Every time you close a deal, you should say, oh, wow, next time in the terms, we should have said this or structure it this way, or optimize the deal in this other way, and keep evolving it over time. Um, the other, what I want to go into now is co-GP and joint venture structures. Um, this strategy is really when a GP, someone who puts a deal together and goes to LPs, which are limited partners, so passive investors in the deal, um, that's how it normally works when an independent sponsor goes out to market. And someone says, oh, and I buy this senior living facility or this office building or self-storage or multifamily, and I'm gonna buy it and put up 1 million of the 10 million needed, go out and raise the 9 million of equity needed to buy this $40 million asset, um, and then manage that for the passive investors. Well, a co-GP agreement is when someone says, well, since I sourced the deal for you, or since I'm putting in half the money or all the money, I wanna do a co-GP deal structure instead. Um, and what, what, how that often happens is from a REIT, a private equity fund, um, billionaire families, large single family offices, publicly traded entities do co-GP deals. And we've seen uh, $30 million seed capital checks get done through a co-GP deal. Uh, when someone took one of our investors out for dinner after one of our events, I told you the story about the eight and the $40 million checks getting uh, done over a three year period from someone calling through our network and meeting with investors. But we also have recently took a 25 million uh, an AUM real estate investment group, and we boosted them up to 140 million of assets under management by connecting them to one co-GP partner. And it had taken them years to build up the 25 million in assets. And now in 18 months, they're at 140 million and they're selling off 100 million of those assets. We also have another group, multifamily. They had 300 million in AUM after four years, and they were very experienced, but they started their multifamily business syndicating four years ago. And now after three months in a co-GP program, they manage 700 million in assets. So they more than doubled in size in three months, so it took them four years to build up. Um, and it's a way to get to kind of the institutional land of raising 25 and $50 million checks at a time, um, having this type of a um, structure, a co-GP structure. So in the last 18 months, we'll put about 100 million of equity to work and to acquire 700 million in assets through a co-GP program that I run with one of my most active clients. And we've signed about $900 million of equity JV agreements this year, um, hoping to sign another 900 million worth this month. And then next year, we're looking to put two to $4 billion of equity JV agreements in place. And you know, 25% of those probably won't make it all the way through the process. We don't expect to place that much equity, but uh, we hope it'll be close close to those numbers, of course. And the main point I wanna make here is just show many case studies and examples of how this can exponentially grow your business. And just to be aware that the co-GP structure is out there and the JV structure is out there. Um, and we're happy to provide feedback. If you have terms from somebody else, we can compare them to the terms that we do. Um, if anyone would like to be part of this program, you know, we're looking for real estate sponsors who would wanna be part of it. So on Monday at the Super Summit, we're going to be, um, you know, we'll have like 16 or 17 meetings at that 800 person event that's just going through this JV agreement with our co-GP partner, for example. All right, the last thing I wanna cover is tax structures. Every deal you do could be made a bit more tax efficient or you could acknowledge the tax impact of it more closely and document it better or have the money come from a tax efficient source. 
An example of this is if you're raising capital, maybe there's a way to structure your deal so that small investors get a profit interest while the larger investors get true equity. And what that means then potentially, if your CPA would bless this and attorneys say it's okay, uh, is that you may be able to have it so that the few holders of the equity, like let's say you raise $10 million and you raise $5 million from small investors who don't ask about cost segregation or bonus depreciation or negative K-1 uh, access, et cetera, and they just get profit distributions uh, and a profit share at the end. And then the other 5 million you raise from large investors, million dollar checks, well, now the 5 million that you raised has the full equity stack because the other people just have a profit interest. So in a normal deal, cost segregation comes out to about 23% of the cost of a normal um, property, multifamily property on average. Um, so if you're looking at that, normally you put in $100, then you would get back 23% that same first year potentially in bonus depreciation from a cost segregation study you could do on the property. But if you structure it in that way I just mentioned, um, then you might get 46% back because you are holding twice as much equity as you normally would have just because of the structure. So um, there's dozens of examples of this. We have a five hour workshop just on structures and I'm covering it here in about 15 minutes, so I'm rushing through it. Uh, but we invested in a dental group that has six dental clinics. They helped them open their sixth location. They were doing 14 million a year in revenue. Now they're doing 2.1 million a month in revenue. We structured that to be 100% negative K1 uh, bonus depreciation the first year. Um, and I don't have time to go over the equipment example, but we're doing the same thing with buying a bunch of equipment for a hotel group this month and offering the investors there uh, the negative K-1 uh, experience as well. I think that deal's probably already closed out. Maybe, maybe, we have, maybe we have the last one or two people coming into that, but um, if you're buying real estate and there's equipment on it, then the equipment can be bonus depreciated typically, and you may be able to, if you're doing enough deals, wrap up that equipment within a separate fund that is super tax efficient for investors if you document it all right and put that equipment into use within the time period you want that negative K1 for. Oh, here's a little bit about how, how that deal is working just as a case study. Basically, you know, we go to someone that has like a hospitality property like this group and they're buying Caterpillar equipment and kitchen equipment and tents for weddings and then wrap that all into something. And so uh, that's all I had to cover here for today. I think I went over by three minutes area internet for, apologize for that. We uh, didn't prevent that, but um, I've got, I've got my whole build built my whole business on giving away things for free, like this free webinar. If you're raising capital, we have a free book on raising capital at capitalraising.com, at familyoffices.com. We have a free book on family offices. Our YouTube channel is packed with videos. Our family office podcast has hundreds of episodes that get downloaded, you know, almost a thousand times every day. And um, our whole business model is to build a funnel uh, by giving away value first, just like we recommended you guys do earlier on in the webinar. So uh, if you have any questions, you can email me uh, at richard at investorclub.com. And I'd love to see some of you at our family office super summit. This is a 800 person event on Monday, December 13th. It's next Monday coming up and it's in Fort Lauderdale. And we have welcome cocktails on Sunday the 12th if you wanna come. Uh, but Monday it starts at 7 a.m. and gets done at 7 p.m. And we'll have 57 speakers on stage in one day. Almost all of them are investors. So you're hearing from family offices, private investors, um, a couple of REITs, a couple of billionaires on stage, a shark from Shark Tank is on stage, um, and we don't pay any speaker to come. So the shark from Shark Tank, the publicly traded companies on stage, they're all coming to get deals done and to share best practices and strategies and have meetings for allocations, et cetera. And um, if you want to register for that, it's just a $99, $99 trial membership. Um, and that's at familyoffices.com forward slash super. Uh, if you are a family office or a private investor and you're not syndicating anything and you don't have a fund and you're not raising capital for your own company or anything, uh, then you can just shoot me an email. We can get you in as an investor, but otherwise you need to sign up for a charter membership with the family office club and able to come to that super summit event. So appreciate everyone's um, attention here today. And I don't have to meet you if there's any other questions you'd like me to, to cover or any questions that you had before we sign off. Yeah, um, one question I had is going back towards the beginning of your presentation, Richard, you, you sort of mentioned, um, you know, 
going where they're not strategy is is one way to uh, try to find opportunities to work with the, the clients that you work with. Um, since we're talking with uh, predominantly a real estate group here, um, obviously multifamily, there's a lot of activity. Uh, the, the build to rent in the single family home space, there's a lot of activity, uh, which means that you know, the pricing is, is still pretty aggressive. Are there particular property types or areas that you find your clients are more interested in trying to avoid the, the herds that are going into some of these other asset classes? Yeah, really good question. I think people like you who are hyper connected in real estate identify these herds earliest and they also try to avoid them the most. You just see how many people are trying to get a 250 unit multifamily property in Texas or Florida, hold it for three to five years, put 10K in per door and hope to produce that 17% IRR or something, right? So there's you know herds of them. Uh, so I would, I would love to, and I know my clients would love to connect with more professionalized um, platforms of mobile home park sponsors. That's something I personally would love to have a, a great sponsor to and put a lot of capital to work with them. Um, we also have had trouble putting money to work in self-storage because there's too much money. So while my clients still want exposure to it, there's so much exposure. We email people and say, hey, do you want $300 million of equity? And they say, no, go away. We have too much money. So uh, that area is so hot that um, it's been hard for us to get any exposure. We still do want some exposure, but so does everybody else. So it just you know, it's a hard game to play. Um, within healthcare, we love uh, medical office building assets. We think cap rates are going to compress there and there's not enough frenzy around those right now. So I think that's a great place to be. Uh, senior living, skilled nursing facilities we're looking into. I'd love to have another partner or two there. And then with multifamily, um, what we like best there is people that are figuring out ways to add ADUs um, or use extra acreage on properties or have a real creative, unique strategy versus just the buy for appreciation and renovate a few units uh, that, that seems like what most people are doing. So we like we like niche things, uh, uncommon strategies, um, and we don't mind sometimes working with a relatively young team if, as long as it's not like their first deal or literally their second deal or something, then we don't, we don't mind that if they have a great strategy and they can it can show how it works. Great, great. All right, um, I don't see any other questions. So uh, with that, we'll wrap it up. Richard, uh, really appreciate you taking the time today. I know you're very busy and you have a lot to do before next Monday, but um, I think it was, a, it was a very interesting and useful conversation for everybody today, so thank you. Awesome, yeah, I hope everyone got at least one thing away from this, whether it was the uh, the three trust curves or to build your investor funnel or to have video content from your founder or to explore co-GP deals more often and uh, look forward to seeing you at the Super Summit on Monday, Demetrius. Take care. Uh, absolutely, thank you everybody. And uh, we do have another session coming up on Thursday with Dr. Jeff Fisher. If you haven't uh, signed up for that, he will be uh, doing an update on market conditions. And uh, beyond that, we don't have anything scheduled for the rest of this year. So happy holidays to everybody. And we'll be back with uh, some other great sessions uh, after the first of the year. Thanks, everybody. Take care.